All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're really glad to have you. This is the Unified Forecast System Short Range Weather or SRW Application Users Training. And um, we just would like to welcome you. We have a large team of people behind the scenes that have been getting ready for this event. And we have a large number of people joining us from all over the world and some of you um, during your overnight hours. So we're excited to have you and I'm looking forward to a really successful week this week. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get us kicked off with some introductions some um, meeting notes and logistical things, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So let's see. To begin, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, UCAR and NCAR are committed to providing a safe and productive and welcoming environment for everyone. And so what this means is please consider new ideas and encourage innovation as we go through this meeting. Uh, show appreciation, be considerate and respectful. Please share the air. Um, you can contribute, but also make sure you're listening. Acknowledge teamwork and open collaboration. Communicate openly and respectfully. And please just remember to offer um, constructive feedback, but no personal attacks. And so if you have any other um, questions or comments about that, um, please feel free to reach out with me to me um, and see more at the website down below here um, for more on our code of conduct. So a few uh, meeting expectations as we get started here. Um, please feel free to just turn on, on your video when you are asking questions if you would like to, but in general, we'll ask you to leave your video off during the presentations. And this just helps us to eliminate some visual distractions. Um, so just please go ahead and just leave that off for the most part. Um, we do encourage our instructors to use their video if their bandwidth uh, allows um, so that you can get to know who's speaking um, and see them. Um, but other than that, we'll, we'll pretty much have our videos off. Uh, along those same lines, remember to remain muted unless you're speaking. Um, and this just helps us again to, dist to avoid distracting background noises. Um, but we do want to hear from you. So if you do have a question, um, we would ask you to either raise your hand in Zoom and you can do that on the bottom bar where it says reactions, there's a, a raise hand um, button. So you feel free to do that and we will call on you there. Um, the other option is to type your question into the appropriate Slack channel. Um, so hopefully you have all been able to uh, log on to our Slack workspace and there are several different channels within there. Um, there's a general channel um, where you can ask any types of just a uh, high level type of questions or issue if you have any issues with your um, logging on or anything like that, please let us know there. Um, in that general channel, I also have a um, message pinned that provides some helpful links that you might find useful. So you can go ahead and take a look at that. Um, if you have any questions during any of the presentation sessions, please feel free to put those into the channel for presentations. And similarly, if questions come up during the practical session, go ahead and put those in the practical session channel. And we'll go ahead and make sure to answer all of those. Um, so we ask again that you try not to use the chat feature in Zoom itself. We'd like to keep everything on the Slack side um, just so that we can keep track of those, make sure that we have all of those answered and archived for future. Um, if you do have any technical issues though, feel free to use the Zoom chat there and Brett will be able to help you for um, using that. And then finally, um, just I know we're all working from home or remote, a lot of us remotely, uh, and it's easy to get distracted in those environments, but please try and remain focused and engaged. I mean, we're really looking forward to having a productive week this week. Oops. Sorry about that. A few other logistics that I wanted to mention. Uh, we will be using Zoom throughout the, the tutorial. So the presentations will all be on the link that you found today. So congratulations, you're in the right place. This is the same link you'll be using for the presentations all week. Uh, for those of you that will be joining us for hands-on practical sessions, it's the same thing. It's a separate link for that, but we'll, once you're in, that will be the same link that we use in the afternoons for the whole week. Uh, during the hands-on practical sessions, we can move individuals into a breakout room for screen sharing with an instructor if that's needed. Um, so you can ask questions and go back and forth one on one in those situations. Um, and again, please use the um, Slack workspace to ask the questions. Do not use the Zoom. Um, there is a link for the agenda found here. 
And again, this is also one of the helpful links that's pinned under, under the general channel under Slack. So feel free to navigate there if you'd like to kind of keep track of where we are and what's coming up next. And as a reminder, all of the presentations and video recording will be um, linked to the agenda after the event. So you will be able to go back and see those later. So just briefly an overview of the agenda, mostly the mornings, or I guess it's morning for us here in mountain time zone, uh, we will have our presentations uh, followed by hands-on practice for those of you that are involved in that um, later in the day. So this is kind of the breakdown, the blue uh, pieces are when we will have everybody, the kind of plenary sessions and everybody is invited to listen to the presentations. The green blocking times here are when we have those of you that are registered for the hands-on practice sessions. So I'd like to take just a couple minutes to go through and um, have you be introduced to all of our instructors that will be speaking this week and helping out during the hands-on practical sessions. Um, so if the instructors wouldn't mind um, to just briefly turn on your cam camera, unmute yourself and say hi. Um, you can just say your name, affiliation, and then the component areas kind of that, that you will be helping out with uh, during this week. And I have a list of all of the instructors. There might be some that are not logged on this morning because they're talking later in the week, um, but I'll go through everybody and give them all a chance to say hi. So um, we'll just go through here in alphabetical order. So Jeff Beck, you are up first. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jeff Beck. I work at NOAA GSL in Boulder. Uh, I do uh, FV3 LAM um, development, general development, um, and that's uh, the same system here that's being used in the short range weather app um, training. And I'll be helping with uh, pre-processing anyone who has any questions about that during the practical session. Um, and uh, that's it. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, hand off to Ben Blake. Ben on. Okay, Ben probably isn't joining us right now, so we'll move on to Jacob. Hello, everybody. My name is Jacob Carley. I'm from NSEP Environmental Modeling Center, where I'm a physical scientist and work in the uh, data assimilation group of the modeling and data assimilation and quality control uh, branch. Um, I'm also the project lead for the rapid refresh forecast system at EMC. And I'm very much excited uh, for this workshop and growing our community. And I will hand it over to Lori Carson. No, Lori. Um, hello, I'm here. Um, I was just trying to get my camera to work, but I don't think it is. Um, maybe it is. Um, I'm Lori Carson. I'm a software engineer in, uh, at NCAR. I work in the Developmental Testbed Center with all of the various numerical weather prediction models that we support. Um, my role here will be primarily work supporting the, and explaining the model and the common community physics package. All right, next we have George Gann. He's on. And I, I can't see all the participants, so I apologize with my screen sharing. So. Um, all right, we'll try Kyle. Wait, wait, I'm here. Can you hear oh, me? Good. Oh, good. Yes. Go ahead, George. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm uh, George uh, Gano. I work for EMC and I work mainly on model pre-processing. And I'm glad to be here this week. Great. Thank you so much, George. All right. Is Kyle there? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kyle Gerheiser. I work at NOAA EMC. And I'm responsible for library and infrastructure. So, um, you know, all the back end stuff that the weather model and all the models uh, need to build with. So, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Lucas. Oh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, I'm Lucas Harris. I lead the uh, FE3 team at GFDL. Um, we uh, develop the dynamical core in use by uh, NOAA, NASA, and a variety of other private international entities. Uh, we also lead the uh, development of the SHIELD weather model, uh, contribute to the uh, GFDL's world leading coupled climate model suite and to other UFS configurations. Great, thank you, Lucas. Tracy, are you on? 
I am. Thank you, Jamie. I'm Tracy Hurtnicki. I work with NCAR and the Developmental Testbed Center, and I will be covering the post-processing component of the SRW, the Unified Post Processor. And so I'll be here to assist you with any questions you have on that. And up is uh, Dom, next. Hi. Can you see me? Hear me? I can hear you, sort of. Okay, well, let's hope the video and everything comes on. All right, so my name is Dom, Dom Heinzeler. I am the lead developer of the CCPP, the Common Community Physics Package, and one of the UFS code managers. And I will be talking later in the week about exactly that code management, how to make contribution to the latest code base, and so on and so forth. And up to Christina. Do we have Christina? There we go. All right. Can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry. I'm Christina Holt. I work at NOAA GSL, and um, I will be here uh, later in the week talking about our experience with EMC working uh, to port the short range weather app to the cloud. Hey, up next is Ming. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me and see me? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm Ming Hu. I'm working with uh, NOAA GSL as a physical scientist. Uh, my major job is develop the RRFS. It's uh, the next generation regional forecast modeling system, which built based on the UFS SR weather app, which we are starting now. So thank you. Uh, next is Cheng Hu, right? <laughs> yep. That's correct. It's me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chan Hu Jeon. Uh, I'm working at NOAA EMC Environmental Modeling Center. Uh, I manage the short range weather app to work well uh, on the NOAA's operational supercomputing system, WCOS, and extend the short range weather app to uh, air quality modeling. And then the RRFS CMAC. Uh, I'll be presenting the ESG grid, extended Schmidt Naumannic grid tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Uh, next up is Mike. Good morning. My name is Mike Kabulich. Uh, I'm an associate scientist uh, working at NCAR in the Developmental Testbed Center. Um, I work on the general development and support for the UFS short range weather app. Um, and I'll be presenting later on this week about uh, how uh, you uh, training attendees as well might be able to uh, contribute code changes back as well. Great. All right, Gerard. Uh, yeah, you can see. Uh, I'm uh, Gerard Katafian. I work at GSL as well as for DTC, and I've been working on the scripts and workflow portion of the of the app for a couple of years now. So I'll be helping out with that and giving a presentation on how to configure the workflow. Thanks, Gerard. Lin Lin. Hi, I'm Lin Lin Pan from Loa GSL. Uh, I mainly work on CCPP, a common community physics package. I will have a presentation on supported uh, CCPP suite in the UFS short range weather app. Thank you. Great, thanks, Lin Lin. Raj? May not be on. How about Larissa? I am here. Hi, um, my name is uh, Larissa Reams. I live in Norman. I work at OU and uh, NSSL. And I've been uh, working for about three years now on uh, the short range weather app and FV3 development and testing. And I'll be presenting tomorrow on the pre-processing system. Great, Julie. Uh, my name's Julie Schramm and I work at NCAR at the Developmental Testbed Center. Uh, I'm a software engineer and I'll be giving a talk this morning on how to run the uh, regional workflow. Great, thanks Julie. And Hendrik. Uh, good, whatever part of the day you're in. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm Hendrik Tolman. I, uh, I spent about 25 years of my career at uh, EMC, 
I started off as the developer of the WaveWatch model, then I was the branch chief of the Marine branch, and uh, for a while I was EMC director. I'm now at uh, headquarters, uh, basically uh, doing uh, all modeling strategy for uh, NOAA, and as such, I'm one of the my, my, my main job is to uh, to uh, uh, promote and uh, bring forward the UFS, which is something that uh, in my broader career I've actually done for about 20 years, not just since that it's, it's officially called UFS. I'll be talking today about uh, some of the background of the UFS and hope to be able to get in and out a little bit on the rest of the week. So looking forward to this uh, nice workshop. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Henrik. Um, and my name is Jamie Wolf. I also work at NCAR in the Developmental Testbed Center, and I co-lead the Short Range Weather App team with Jeff Beck um, in the DTC. And I'll be talking um, shortly about an overview of the Short Range Weather App to kind of get us kicked off. So, um, so thank you all to all of our instructors for the introductions. We're looking forward again to having you all here this week and providing information to all of the registered participants, which we have 99 of. So thank you all for registering and being here with us. We're, we're really excited about that. And again, especially for those of you that are joining in the middle of the night, um, wow, that's, that's dedication. So thank you again. We hope that you get what you need out of this uh, tutorial. So with that, I will stop here and see if there are any logistical type questions at this point before we go ahead and get started with kind of the main program. Has there been anything come through Slack or anything, Jeff? Are we good? Nope, haven't seen anything there. Okay, great. All right, so I will stop sharing and hopefully I stopped sharing. Okay, and I will hand it over to Hendrik who's going to be giving us an overview and um, some talk about the vision of the UFS. So Hendrik, go ahead and share your screen and kick us off. It's probably, probably a lot easier if I switch my camera and stuff on. So can you see my screen at the moment? Yes, yes we can yeah. see it. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking a bit about the uh, background of, uh, of why we have this application to begin with, because this is uh, part of, of the unified forecast system. And so I can talk about the unified forecast system forever. I'll give you a little bit of a background and I'll give you a little bit of the things that we're doing going forward with. I'm gonna talk uh, a suspiciously little about the short range weather app because that's the everybody else to talk about. So I'll basically focus on what else there is. So bottom line up front, uh, NOAA is moving to a unified forecast system uh, for several reasons. Uh, the, one of the key drivers to begin with was to simplify the production suite. Uh, another thing is to uh, accelerate R2O. Uh, and then the third one is that uh, we're living in a, in a world that uh, uh, we no longer have the biggest computers at NOAA and we have a very broad community that can help us and we want to broaden the base of people that can work with us. And so this workshop is a really good example of that. We have a release of, a, uh, of an application and we are now actively training people so that we hope that uh, a lot of you will be uh, allowing us to uh, pick up your innovations and put them really rapidly in up in, into operations. So this was an idea for a long time, apart from some component models that we did this with for a long time, but it really is uh, a reality now. Where we have the medium range and the short range weather app being, uh, uh, being uh, uh, supported as a uh, full release we are working on things like uh, hurricane analysis and forecast system and uh, uh, other prototype systems that are all essentially already working with the same code base, although there is no, not necessarily a full uh, 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 supported release of these things. And there are also other things like we just finished a few weeks back, a, a ocean and ice reanalysis that can be used by the uh, UFS. So the UFS as a whole, uh, you probably heard about this before and I have nowhere near enough time to talk about this in general, but the idea is that we're moving to a community developed research tool that is the basis for NOAA operations, that we do everything by evidence-based decision-making, which is something that we've done for a long time, but it's not always been made clear how we do that. Uh, the idea is that we have a significantly large software stack of things that we can do, but we really focus on applications of these. So we focus on uh, actionable outcomes and things that can go into operations. 
it is a unified system uh, that is unified, not a unitary. Uh, the goal is not to have just one model. The goal is to have the best possible business model where we create enough diversity for research, but enough focus for getting rapid progress at the same time. And then the whole idea is that this is really a paradigm shift for what NOAA is doing. Uh, and not no longer developing our own models, but working with a very broad community on rapidly going forward with both research and operations. So in a nutshell, I can talk about this easily for half an hour, but some of the milestones that we have, we have buy-in at, uh, at the administrator level of NOAA. Uh, there is a unified modeling committee that has been set up a few years back to really uh, sort of support this. Uh, two years back, uh, we signed an MOA between the Weather Service, NCAR, uh, NCAR and OAR on infrastructure. Uh, on the right of the screen, on the bottom, you see the seven things we're working on. Uh, we're really looking at this from a community modeling perspective. Uh, we are looking at this for research and operations. Uh, we have a we are in year two right now of a UFS R2O project where we are trying to have a much more holistic uh, use of NOAA funding to support the UFS. And then very recently, uh, we have started a NOAA modeling board uh, that allows us to negotiate within NOAA to effectively work on something like this. And then we have the Earth Prediction Innovation Center which uh, is a contract that has just been awarded earlier this year and we're just starting executing that and the graphics on the right uh, you'll you'll see um, a top right uh, the red pieces are all the building blocks and around that are the applications no you can't read that but it's just eye candy here uh, the, the figure below that shows some applications from a community perspective the little figure figure in the middle shows uh, a lot of different applications on the left of the figure moving in the future to a much smaller settlement and then the bottom right are the different uh, components of the MOA with NCAR. So we've been talking about this in theory for a long time, but it's really becoming practice now. Uh, we have something called the graduate student test that went with some of the uh, releases where we can literally install an application in a day uh, on your laptop if you want to. Uh, before it would take a team of several people uh, several months and you had to buy a supercomputer to be able to duplicate what we we're doing so this is a massive change of the way we're doing business we have a medium range weather and a short range weather application that are released there are actually two releases already of the medium range and then other things they may not be released yet but there is full access to the code base by the community even if there's no release for instance for the hurricane uh, analysis and forecast system for the coupled prototype s2s model and other things and then this is really a conglomeration of a lot of tools. So uh, we have access to things like the CCPP that already were mentioned by our instructors a little earlier. Things like MET and MET Plus, uh, things like uh, uh, tools for coupling and things like that. And last but certainly not least, uh, we are linking to what the Joint Center of Satellite Data Assimilation with the JEDI project is doing for data assimilation. So is this R2O acceleration really happening? Uh, we have experiences with uh, the WaveWatch model and H4 model particularly that show us that the UFS community approach is much more efficient. Uh, in WaveWatch, we've been able to show that um, we could uh, get things into operations, a brand new model in 18 months instead of three to five years or three to five to seven years. And with H4, uh, we can see that in the annual upgrade cycle, we have now three to five innovation showing up every year instead of one or two. So we're really accelerating R2O pretty significantly. In the UFS itself, it's a little bit too early to show that. But having said that, we actually had a period early this year that uh, GFS was the number one model on the anomaly correlations for a week straight, which is something that has not happened in the, in the recent history. So hopefully that is a sign of things to come. Uh, the core of this thing is the release schedule. I won't go through this in, uh, in detail, but in blue, are the actual formal releases, uh, the medium range weather or the short range weather from March this year is the core of this workshop. Uh, similarly, uh, we have in red actual implementations and operations of, uh, of UFS code. So the GFS V16 and the GAFS V12 are actually now UFS based operational systems and they start simplifying the production suite because they start coupling in wave models and aerosol models already. Uh, what is really new here is more on the bottom uh, uh, bullets here. So the short range weather app was made available in March, but we don't really think that this goes into operations until at the earliest 2023 or 2024. 
So this is a hugely different way of doing business. Normally, if you would want to do research with an operational system in the weather service, you would have to go and um, uh, wait until it was in operations and then you could take a look at it. The fact that we now, three years before operations, give the research community access to the code uh, is a hugely different way that should accelerate uh, our capability of taking innovations into. And then, um, uh, like, like already said, there are, we are just focusing here on actually what's in the production suite, but don't forget the MET, the CCPP, the JEDI FA3, and, JEDI FA3, and all, all the other ancillary things that are really important for this here, including things like ESMF and, uh, and new OPSI. So there are some other foci in the UFS. Uh, so the RRFS and the HES development are very closely linked to the short range weather app. Uh, I'm not, not going to talk too much about that, uh, other than that uh, even if there's no app available, like uh, app developed, sorry, if there's no app released for it let, yet, like the HES model, uh, the HES model is using exactly the same code base as the RFS and as the uh, short range weather uh, release. And we're a place where these things are going to link back to each other is that in the HES model, we are Supporting the capability of doing relocatable and movable nests that we so far have only been using for hurricanes, but tentatively that same software and that same technology is going to be used in the warn and forecast system that provides higher resolution and faster cycling than the RFS with the same code. So I'm not going to talk much about that anymore, or not at all anymore, since this is the subject of the rest of this workshop. I do want to talk about a few more things that are going on in the UFS. One is the coupled prototype S2S model. Uh, other is uh, us talking about workflow, and the last one is uh, the UFS working on formalizing the whole process of uh, innovation to operations. So the prototype, uh, thanks to Jessica Mikeson from EMC to uh, to do this. The prototype number one had uh, atmosphere, ocean, ice, uh, as described here, with waves linked in but not quite active, uh, with a uh, 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 NEMS uh, driver and a NEMS mediator originally. Uh, we've been uh, systematically testing this system and building out upon it. So the first four prototype experiments were mostly uh, about uh, improving the initial conditions and then uh, moving the wave model fully in there. The next four sets of these are uh, uh, much more about the development of the system. So in prototype five, we went to CICE6 and created a, a fractional uh, grid uh, for the atmosphere to talk to uh, either land or ocean. In prototype six, we went to the GFS V16 physics and the vertical resolution, and we went to the community CMAPS mediator, and uh, those things are finished. We're now working on prototype seven, uh, which has a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, technical upgrades in it, and then prototype eight uh, will be about getting some uh, more advanced DA in there and some physics tuning. On the right side with prototype six, we are now at the layout that we're envisioning with the shared infrastructure with NCAR. And I don't want to show too much uh, in results, but uh, uh, one of the reasons for doing this coupled modeling is because we had uh, issues in the existing seasonal forecast systems uh, about uh, ice not being done very well. So black here is the um, uh, uh, annual uh, ice over uh, a year. Uh, the, gr the gray whiskers were the clearly driving away of the CFS V2 uh, from the correct initial conditions, and the blue and the red here are the coupled system that out of the box are doing a heck of a lot better already. Uh, if you want to know more about this, talk to Avicho Mira and Jessica Meissner at EMC. Uh, with this, uh, about a, a few weeks ago, we also had the first new uh, ocean ice reanalysis done that we've, uh, uh, for the first time in a long, long time, uh, without going into the details, this is all uh, already UFS model based, it's JEDI based, so it's really going into the right direction in terms of the unified system. And just to give you a, a really uh, simple idea, the gray is the error of the free model, the blue is the initial, uh, and the red is the final uh, DA system that uh, was created. So we have a very nice 40-year uh, uh, ocean ice reanalysis now that we can use for the seasonal and subseasonal models and for uh, doing statistical correction on these things. Next part I wanted to talk about is a little bit about workflow. Uh, again, for the UFS, we not the goal is not to have one workflow, but to make sense of having a workflow system that works for everybody in the best possible way with the best possible diversity. 
workflow is something that the original discussions tended to be a little bit about, um, uh, hey, use my system because it, it works nice. But we went back to the to the basics, to the, the requirements uh, instead of solutions. So we looked at from a software engineering perspective and from a systems engineering perspective. And I don't have the time to really talk uh, extensively about that, but the outcome of this discussion was that one size does not fit all. I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And that instead we're looking at the library with a matrix of, uh, uh, of uh, tools that uh, can be used to make custom, uh, uh, very rapidly built custom uh, workflows for separate, separate applications. So from the systems per engineering perspective, uh, the critical aspects for efficiency depend a lot on the application. So if you have something that uh, that very rapidly cycles, like the RFS, like uh, some of the things that uh, this week's uh, workshop are talking about, uh, the latency between DA and modeling is a key element in getting an efficient system. And so for a RFS type uh, application, you really want to have the DA and uh, the model run in core at the same time so that you don't have to go through the file system uh, to and lose a lot of latency time that way. However, if you have like a seasonal forecast system, uh, resource needs for the DA part and for the modeling part are very different. Different. So if you want to do that efficiently, you separate the two out. So uh, we're looking at common elements in the workflow, but not a single workflow to do everything uh, in terms of be efficient. And to give you just a little bit of taste of what that means, over the top here, you have the, the uh, pieces of the uh, systems engineering. You, you typically have to do input processing, you have to do initialization to a model on a product generation. Uh, on the left side, you have the software engineering parts from going through the code to having a script to run it, to a configuration, to a scheduler. And uh, I will not go into all the details of the things that are in here. But the red box here are places where we think that we can have a library of uh, components and tools that we then use in the in uh, in the bottom to uh, uh, in the blue part uh, to get uh, very quickly to uh, tailored uh, applications that are easy to get into operations. And at this moment, uh, uh, Ben Cash of uh, um, uh, 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 George Mason and uh, uh, Arun Chawla are leading an effort to scope how much work it is to actually get this to be built. So that's where we are right now. So the last subject I want to talk about a little bit is about us systematically working on uh, the R2O process of the I2O process. We usually talk about R2O because research is already being done and we want to get that into operations. We want to make the UFS more general from the really in initial ideas about uh, 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 new things. So. Uh, innovation to operations to have a larger reach of the things that we're doing. The original report on this was uh, written for, by the UFS and published in 2018. What we're developing right now is a three-part report. One talks about assumptions, best practices, requirements and constraints. One describes the process and one describes essentially the governance. And they have a shared preamble and we have a, a few dozen uh, pieces of documentation around that we're going to make, pub uh, make available to the public. So part one is not really a conventional report, but it's a gathering of basic principles. We talk about assumptions, requirements, and constraints about best practices and about desired outcomes. The thing that we are just getting into a little bit, and that's why it's put in red here, and that we haven't really looked at with the UFS red, uh, yet in the past is managing, ri managing risk. So that is something that we start doing in this part one. Part two is really about the process of that. So we started out with the funnel that Louis made about 15 years ago. But this is really a sort of inside of NOAA funnel. This is not a community funnel. So we're really looking at stages and gates that we work with. And so this is the, the newer picture of what we're looking at. So stage one is the ID, ideation. So it's a real initial part of innovation. Then uh, stage two is about preliminary experimentation. Stage three is moving this to a pre-operational environment. Stage four is moving it to an operational environment and uh, like environment and testing the, do the last testing. And then the stage five is getting it into operations. All these stages are linked to the readiness level that's you, that NOAA is using uh, to, uh, to track and, uh, and uh, uh, manage uh, innovation in R2O. And then the important part here is that you have to pass a gate uh, to go from one stage to the other. 
once all this is done over the top, you move from left to right, and then you decide what is uh, the customer's need, what the errors are, you figure out what the next project is, and you go around. But this is not just one circle every now and then. You have to go back and forth from gate two, three to two, for instance. So this is a very cyclical process. And so this is fairly, uh, fairly uh, um, theoretical uh, to make this realistic and to show the community what we're already doing. We selected uh, 11 uh, use cases that uh, uh, we use to describe to the community what we're doing already, but also to assess what our capabilities and our gaps are. And so the number one here is just to, to allow the community to understand what it takes for EMC to get something to NCO. This is a well-described process and well-documented. Then there are three examples of uh, uh, real implementations. Uh, to show how well how, how this is done, how different implementations have different levels of maturity to do this process uh, in a systematic way and the difference between uh, different implementations at this point. Uh, then we have a whole bunch of other things like how we decided to go to the FE3 DICE or uh, how we're doing prototyping of coupled models without uh, really having said yet uh, where exactly they're going to end up in operations. How you look at uh, things like a component of this, like the post-processing, how you look at uh, uh, more uh, structural innovation, how you look at an architecture component like the CCPP, and uh, realizing that there are projects that are actually completely out of the UFS that still contribute to that as a, one of the projects. And so having gone through all these things, we came up with a list of about three pages of uh, table uh, that show what we're doing and what the gaps are. And just an example of that is that, uh, which is very relevant for here. We recognize that we have two code releases, but we recognize that there's much more that needs to be done. Uh, we recognize that our graduate student tests have been done ad hoc, but that uh, the UFS needs to come up with an approach uh, for doing graduate students as a systematic part of the UFS and how to resource that. So this is about the technology of what you're doing for a single project. So part three talks more about you have a big funnel of all kinds of things coming in. And then actually you have all kinds of different funnels with different beginning and ending points. You have very small uh, implementations. You have very systematic implementations that are all somewhat different. So here we also go through a set of uh, use cases. Uh, in this case, specifically, we are looking at. So what is going in on inside of NOAA? And the uh, example is... Um, uh, the UFS R2O project, how NOAA already does reach out to the broader community by funding them for doing selected work, which are the NOAA funding opportunities where we use the JTTI as an example, the Joint Technology Transfer Initiative. Then we're also looking at external contributions that came originally from outside of NOAA and have made it into operations. The example there is the introduction of unstructured grids in the Wave Watch 3 Wave model. And then there are uh, projects that are completely bypassing NOAA, although they're using uh, all of our software that have a big impact on us too. And this is the example is a pre-UFS, but it is a good example of how that works, which is the uh, NOAA, NOAA, the National Oceani Oceanographic Partnership Program wave model project from a few years back. And so what we get out of this is just an identification on the top right of uh, where the main focuses are. So dark green is the main focus of NOAA, light green is the minor focuses, dark yellow is the main focus of the external community, and light yellow is the minor focus. And you can see that if you go from inside of NOAA to outside of NOAA, there's a diagonal separation between what NOAA is doing, what the community is doing. Uh, we want to get rid of that separation and by having this into a, to a much more uh, unified uh, uh, systematic process across the across the whole uh, uh, gamut of people that work with the UFS. On the bottom side is a description of who actually makes the decisions right now. You can see that same thing, uh, a little bit of a separation between community and NOAA uh, across the diagonal. So one of the outcome points that we are now discussing with the UFS steering committee is the fact that the UFS steering committee, as it was originally envisioned, really should become uh, sort of the clearinghouse for this process and manage uh, uh, where the different projects are in terms of uh, the stages engaged. Uh, and this is something that we are uh, developing right now. Having said that, I've talked a lot so far. Uh, and I hope I have a, a few minutes uh, for some questions. So I will uh, uh, give it back to our organizers to see uh, if they want to manage some questions. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Andre.
Do you, does anybody have any questions for Hendrik? Feel free to raise your hand here or you can put them into the Slack uh, presentations channel if you'd like to. All right, Russell, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, good day, Hendrik. Um, so do you think there's still gonna be some of the component models will still undergo development outside of the UFS system, or do you think it will all just be integrated into the UFS system and only undergo development through that process? Uh, good, good question. Good question, Russell. Uh, on the um, on the UFS website, we have a uh, uh, in April we we uh, released our uh, most recent uh, governance document. And uh, at this point, uh, the, the, the choices we made, uh, for instance, with NCAR and in the MOA that we have with, uh, with NCAR, is that we, uh, we do the coupling at a fairly high level, uh, basically uh, by wrapping the component models. Uh, that's a choice that we're making uh, right now because that's the easiest way to get into coupled modeling. Perhaps on the long run, we have to start uh, doing that coupling uh, at a much more uh, integral level inside of the code. Uh, but uh, with the strategy that we have right now, we basically do that because our component models should be both uh, uh, easy to use as a coupled component or as a standalone model. And so for now, we really see these component models to keep their own, uh, their own environment to work in. And we specifically in our government says that we uh, we are not looking to replace the whole uh, I2O process and the governance of the, comp uh, of the coupled models. And we basically uh, uh, give a, a bunch of high level requirements that we have to that uh, governance in terms of the, when, when a component model changes things around, we expect them to do no harm with what is already done before. Uh, but the long story short is that we expect these component models to remain their own component, their own, um, own uh, communities for a while. And we don't want to, um, to impose from the UFS how these component models are run, except for the fact that they have to uh, to uh, uh, follow certain uh, quality assurance and and, and 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 things like that. And like I said, the do no harm part. Uh, that may change in another 10 years, but for the short term, we want to do that because that also allows us to uh, add new alternatives for component models in a relatively easy way. And we believe that the diversity that we uh, encourage with that is, uh, is really important at this stage yet and that uh, if we would integrate all these codes into a single uh, uh, homogeneous code base at this time that will be detrimental to development of the individual and the component models so that's why we are right now russell i hope that makes it clear yep thanks mike and uh, and uh, thanks for being here in the middle of the night <laughs> other questions for hendrik Lucas, did you have your hand raised? Uh, yes, I did. Go so, ahead. Uh, oh, so thank you. So uh, NOAA's couple of climate models, especially the GFDL modeling suite, are among some of the best in the world. And they have their own uh, pretty strong communities behind them. Do they fit into this at all, especially given that uh, the Weather Service's prerogative only goes out to two years, whereas the climate modeling prerogative goes anywhere from weeks to millennia? Yeah, so, so thanks for that question, uh, much appreciated. Um, Thank you. First of all, all the components of the GFDL models are already part of the UFS, a lot of them. So the MOM6 uh, is, the, is the good example of that. And the fact that we, uh, we adopted the FE3 uh, uh, DICOR. Uh, the, the, the difference between uh, GFDL and, uh, and uh, what we have in the UFS right now is mostly in the coupling and, uh, and into the, the use of uh, FMS or uh, the higher level coupling. Uh, the short answer is that we are in discussions of uh, uh, expanding the UFS applications to uh, work on uh, work for the longer time scales too. We are also uh, between the weather service and the UFS side in discussions on uh, how to properly uh, uh, merge the different coupling techniques. Uh, it is something that is definitely possible because we're already using the component models uh, and it is something that we are very much interested in. Uh, 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 we're not interested in, uh, in um, 
building different stovepipes in NOAA as a whole from a from a top level NOAA perspective, but we're also very uh, cognizant of the fact that we do not want to uh, uh, kill really good existing capabilities. So this is a uh, uh, a ongoing um, uh, uh, topic of discussion uh, within the UFS or within broader NOAA and. Uh, I got good hopes that uh, this is going to be really productive over the next few years. And so, uh, yes, uh, uh, we we uh, uh, definitely want to uh, to acknowledge, uh, in some way, shape, or form, the the really good climate models from GFDL and the fact that they are already very closely linked to uh, what we're doing in the UFS. And we're exploring how we can make that linkage stronger. Thanks. Uh, look, that's wonderful, Hendrik. Thank you so much. All right. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, we'll go ahead and move on. All right. Thanks, Hendrik, for a great overview of the UFS. That was fantastic. Um, we'll move my on to, to. Sorry. I said my pleasure. <laughs> okay. Thanks. We'll move on to, to Jamie Wolf, who's going to provide an overview of the Shortridge Weather App release. All right. Is that coming through okay, Jeff? Looks good. Great. All right. So as Jeff mentioned, I'm going to have a, provide an overview of the short range weather app release that we had um, back in March. And this is largely going to be um, the basis for what you're going to be learning about this week. Though you may have noticed that we also had a small bug fix release um, last week, just a few tweaks um, to make sure that everything was working smoothly for you all this week. So um, my name is Jamie Wolf. As um, you have, I've met you before. Um, at the introduction session. And I wanna just say uh, thanks to my co-leads for the release team. Um, they included Jeff Beck, Jacob Carley, and Curtis Alexander. And um, we were just the, the leads of a very large team that contributed to the overall release efforts. Um, there was a number of organizations that participated, including the Developmental Testbed Center, um, several labs at NOAA, including GFDL, EMC, GSL, NSSL, and GLURL. Uh, we also had NCAR involved, and then a number of cooperative institutes, including CIRA, Ceres, and SIMS. Um, for the release, we split up into a number of different focus teams, and, and the leads for each of those are listed on this title slide as well. And underneath all of those people were even more people that helped to get all of this ready and out the door. So um, it was a very large effort, and we appreciate everybody that contributed to, to it. So um, as you just heard a little bit of the background from Hendrik, NOAA's numerical weather prediction efforts have organized around a vision of a unified community-based modeling system, which is known as the UFS. Uh, the UFS is configurable across multiple different domains and it goes from the global to the regional to convection allowing and ultimately um, down to cloud resolving forecasts um, in the future. Um, it is designed to be the source system for operational applications uh, but we're also really focused on enabling research advancements as well. Um, and so that's why we're here training other users out in the community to um, also be able to run, learn how to run and develop and contribute back to this system. So the applications, um, there are seven different applications in the UFS um, right now. They include the medium range weather, S to S, hurricane, short range weather, space weather, coastal and air quality. And each of these obviously supports a particular forecast requirement. Um, and they all have some type of combination of numerical model, data simulation, pre and post processing. Um, they each have a, a workflow and then other elements that include, that encompass the entire application. Uh, so as you know, you are here this week to learn about the short range weather app, which covers short range weather and convection allowing atmospheric phenomena from less than an hour out to several days. So our goals for this release really were to design a code base that the research community can run, um, use for research, and then commit any resulting innovation back to the relevant repositories. And so we're excited to um, have you here this week and learning more about that. Uh, the aim of the release was really to introduce the limited area version of the UFS to the broader scientific community. So that, that is specifically um, the short range weather application. Um, so we allow users to run experiments with a user-friendly workflow. 
Um, it has been shown to port pretty easily across multiple platforms. A lot of that work was done before the release, and so you can move it around. We have detailed documentation of the entire system, and we also provide support through online forums. And so you're going to hear a lot more about all of these different aspects as we go through the week. So uh, what is the short range weather application made up of? So it includes the finite volume cube sphere dynamical core or FB3. And for this particular application, it is configured using the limited area model or LAM capability. Um, it has the interoperable physics suites come from the common community physics package or CCPP. And the application includes a user-friendly build system that, you, uh, that is invoked through CMake. Um, you generate an experiment, and then you can use either the Rokoto workflow manager or standalone scripts to run those. Uh, those scripts that are run either through work Rokoto or standalone are the same scripts, so we are avoiding duplication or divergence of any of those. Um, so regardless of the way that you run it, you're running the exact same scripts. The application runs a pre-processing. Um, it runs the model and then it does post-processing. And that was what was officially released in March. Uh, since then, we have had further development that has happened. And there are additional capabilities that are included in the develop branch of the repository, um, but they're not fully supported and released yet. So um, as you will learn throughout this week, you still do have access to running the develop branch. Once you learn how to use the system, you're welcome to move over there and have access to more of the newer capabilities um, including ensemble capabilities and verification tasks as well. And then the final stage of what was released was there are Python scripts available for basic generation of graphics. And that is not run through the workflow manager, that is run standalone. So um, you'll also be able to um, have access to those and, and create some images uh, from the forecast model that you run. Again, we have comprehensive documentation and full user support through the um, forums. So uh, the short range weather application um, is based on the FE3 dynamical core, which was originally um, a global configuration that used the mnemonic projection where great circles serve as model coordinates. Um, the the um, domain is covered by six tiles globally, um, which provides nice grid uniformity when it's um, configured in this way. And you can also do refinement through Schmidt transformations and nesting. But again, it was required to run the full global domain. So um, because of the motivation by convection allowing modeling application needs, there was a limited area model capability that was developed. And uh, for within the short range weather app, there are two grid generation methods that are supported. Um, the standard Schmidt refinement or GFDL grid and the extended Schmidt mnemonic or ESG grid. And largely what we have included for predefined domains within the app uh, use the ESG grid. And this is mostly due to the high uniformity and the horizontal grids, grid spacing across the domain. And you can see a little bit of that in the plot on the right-hand side here, where uh, with the ESG grid, you see a little bit more uniformity and the horizontal grid spacing um, whereas with the, the GFDL grid, you see that um, the grid spacing becomes much finer as you go out into the corners of the domain. So with the uh, released version um, back from back in March, we did have pre three predefined contiguous uh, UGS CONUS, or CONUS domains, and those included a 13, three, and a 25 kilometer domain. Um, again, all of those were using the ESG grid, and this is just another plot here showing um, the variation in the grid spacing uh, for the different domains. So the GFDL grid you can see has a lot, uh, much more, much larger variation in horizontal grid spacing um, compared to the ESG grid. And the ESG grid is actually even more uniform than the original HER grid, uh, which is a wharf based domain. Uh, there are also tools that are available for users to define their own domain um, through the release, and you will be learning more about those this week as well. So you, you are not required to just stick with the uh, predefined CONUS domains that you, we um, have supported with the original release. 
Um, in addition, the model can be initialized with either a HER, RAP, NAM, or GFS um, as external model data sources. And so um, you have some options or um, choices there as well. In terms of the application features, again, um, the first thing you need to do is obtain the code. Um, largely, that is done through the UFS Short Range Weather App Umbrella Repository. Uh, and then you invoke an, a CMake system that um, compiles or builds all of the different components through the, for the Short Range Weather App. Uh, there are some prerequisite libraries that are needed before you can make this build the system. Uh, on some platforms, there are already there and available for you to just point for, to. Otherwise, um, you will need to do that as well, and you'll be hearing more about those libraries um, later this week. Once you have the system built, then you can generate an experiment, and there are a number of different ways that you can customize this as you go through. Um, and Gerard will be talking more about that in the next day or two. Uh, once you have all of your, your config files set with your customization, customization set, um, then you generate the experiment and that will build the configuration files and name list that you need to actually run the system. Again, then after that's done, you execute the task management using either Rakoto or standalone scripts. It depends on if you have access to a queuing system or if you um, have Rakoto built on your platform or not. Um, either, either approach is, is, works well. Um, again, it runs the pre-processing, the model, and post-processing. And then you have access to the Python scripts for um, basic graphic generation after that. Uh, so the graphic on the right here just shows a little bit about the flow of how things move through the system. In terms of the uh, workflow itself, there are a number of different tasks that are included there. Um, the first three, the make grid, make org, and make surface climo, which you'll be hearing about more during the pre-processing section, are only run once per experiment. So once those kind of static files are generated, you do not need to run them again if you have additional cycles that you're running for. Uh, once you have run those, then you get into the things that are specific for each cycle and have to be run multiple times. So um, getting the external initial conditions and lateral boundary conditions, um, processing those so that they can be used to then run the forecast and then post-process the forecast. So that is the flow of the workflow itself. In terms of the physics suites that are supported um, officially with the release, we had two, the GFS v15.2 and the RRFS v1 alpha. The GFS v15.2 was operational at the time that we were preparing for this release. And this is recommended mostly for use of the coarser resolution. Um, if you wanted to run at something like 25 kilometers, it, this would be a, a good physics suite choice for that. Um, as you get down to the finer resolutions and being much more forward looking for what ultimately we would like supported or uh, running in operations for the RRFS um, that you heard Hendrik mention as, um, as well, the rapid refresh forecast system, which will be operational likely in the 2023-24 timeframe. Um, this is a more forward looking physics suite in that case. Um, we do expect that there will be even a few more things that will change, um, specifically the PBL and the gravity wave drag as we further develop and test the system in the next couple of years. Um, but again, if you're looking to run at the finer resolutions, we would recommend going more towards something um, a phys using this physics suite. So as has been alluded to, all of the components um, that are included in the short range weather app are in public repositories. And so you, there is a link here for all of those and you have access to those. Um, if you run into issues and would like to create um, a, an issue or ultimately if you have further development that you would like to contribute back, you are encouraged to create pull requests within the, each of those um, repositories. And you'll hear more about kind of how that process and protocol works later this week. Um, a lot of these repositories also have wiki pages that are included that provide some helpful getting started information. So you might check that out as well, in addition to the um, Short Range Brother App user's guide that, that I have pointed to you. 
Okay, so speaking of the short range weather app user's guide, um, there is a link here for that. All of the components that are included in the short range weather app are um, documented in that, that user's guide. It includes UFS utilities, which is the pre-processing side of things, um, the UFS weather model, the die core, the physics, the post-processing, and et cetera. So um, a large number of things available there. Uh, this particular link is also pinned in the general channel um, on the Slack workspace. So if you would like access to have that handy during this week, um, feel free to access this from there. And as mentioned several times now, um, we also answer questions on the forum, the UFS Communities Forum. Um, th so there are a number of subject matter experts or SMEs that watch those forum boards and answer questions as they come in. Uh, but we do encourage users to also start watching those, um, see the questions that come in. And if you are able to know, or if you do know the answer and are able to help out, um, we'd like to start building that knowledge within the community so that other people are answering questions beyond just the SMEs. And this will just be a more efficient process for getting answers out to everybody. Uh, as Hendrik mentioned, we did, for the short range weather application, have a graduate student test included. And this really was to help measure the success of the release. And so what we were trying to do is see whether students can actually um, easily in under six hours, get, build, run, and run the code, and then change the code and look at the differences, um, make sure that it's running correctly. If they needed assistance, they knew kind of where to ask for support, how to find something in the documentation. So all of these things needed to be done in under six hours. Uh, and then there was a questionnaire that the students could fill out to provide input on how that whole process went. Uh, so the short range weather app GST was a severe weather case from the 15th of June, 2019. And this will this case will largely become familiar to those of you that will be um, or participating in the uh, hands on practical session this afternoon as this will be the case that we largely work with uh, throughout the week um, with our different um, options that we're going to be testing and showing you how to um, compare and contrast and, and modify, et cetera. So um, this was something that was also included in the short range weather app. And again, largely looking to make sure that this is highly portable and easy to understand and, and um, easy for the user community to just kind of spin up and learn. So. All right, so again, I Henrik showed this graphic, uh, a small little version of this graphic in his slides as well. Um, this is affectionately called the rainbow diagram. Uh, and so what we're showing here is that um, you can see that there was a very large number of systems running in operations at EMC and there, and there still is. Um, but over time, the goal is to make those, to unify those to largest, um, to a smaller number of systems. And so for this particular application, the short range weather application, we're kind of looking at the blue shading, um, which over time in the next few years will condense down into from like things like the high res windows, the NAM, the RAP, the HER, um, the, the HREF, the ensemble forecasting, et cetera. All of those will be um, consolidated into this RRFS um, as we move through time. And so. Um, that is the goal of the UFS. And again, you can see similarly, things that, like that are being done with the medium range and, sub, and uh, S to S scales as well, um, kind of up here in the green shading. So ultimately, we're really excited to have you join us this week and to join the UFS community. Um, we're looking forward to having you conduct the scientific research by running the code and analyzing the output. We're excited to see you share results through presentations and publications um, through a number of different forums as we go forward once you have learned how to use the system and really start digging in. Um, if you develop additional code or techniques or innovations, um, it would be great to have those contributed back. So having you open issues and um, submitting pull requests in, back into the code base is a big um, big reason why we're, we're doing this. We want to support the research to operations or RTO uh, transitions. Um, if you do run into issues, please feel free to report those either on the UFS forum or through the GitHub issues themselves. And again, just to reiterate that 
Um, when you're on the UFS forum, we ask that you ask and try and answer questions um, as you're able on, on that forum. If you'd like to further be involved and, and are looking for additional funding sources to do UFS type uh, research, we would recommend that you take a look at the NOAA NOFO or the Notice of Funding Opportunities that went out. There's a lot of options um, specifically for UFS based research. Uh, there is also a DTC visitor program that you are free to apply for, um, for PIs and graduate students to come and visit us and work with the system. And then um, just for more information, there are newsletters that come out on a generally quarterly basis for the UFS and the DTC. Um, so feel free to also check those out for further information. And once you have learned how to use the system and you're doing your research, we look forward to seeing you at a future UFS users workshop to hear more about what you're doing at that point. So I think with that, I am finished and I will go ahead and open it up for questions. Jack, I think I see your hand up. Yeah, hi, Jamie. I was wasn't wondering whether to ask the question or put it into the Slack channel there, but on one of the on the bottom of one of your slides, you mentioned the UPP portion of the overall SRW and that there's Python code in there to turn Grib2 into some visuals. So I was just curious, and I, I tried to look down through the tree there on GitHub to see if there is some sample code there, but I couldn't find it. So I was just, should I put that into the Slack channel link there to ask the question or? Yeah, so there are, are, are you asking whether there are what? scripts to run, the, the Python scripts are available to run? Yeah, if they're listed there inside of the overall app, you know, link that you gave. Yeah, so um, I, we can be sure to send you a link to the regional workflow um, repository as well. The Python scripts are actually in that repository which is underneath the, the umbrella repository for the short range weather app. So um, I, we can go ahead and if you wanna put that question in Slack, we'll make sure to point you to the right location. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Jeff, I don't know if there's anything else that's come through Slack. Yeah, I was just going to mention that there's a question uh, in Slack on what uh, the differences are in UFS as compared to earlier WERF and MPAS models. So I, it, I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, you know, you, you, the UFS is based around the FE3 die core, which is a different die core than, than uh, the WERF and the MPAS die core. So that's the main difference there. And the UFS is a, you know, a framework that's being developed, as Hendrik mentioned, in, in NOAA to uh, provide a, a way for development to take place uh, with help from the community. So it's not just uh, internal NOAA development. So hopefully that answers the question there. Yeah, and just, just to briefly mention, um, so with the CCPP or the Common Community Physics Package, uh, there are some efforts underway to make sure that the physics packages that are included within that can be run um, both, in, uh, both in the UFS as well as in MPAS, for example. Um, and hopefully some of the CCPP folks can uh, chime in on that later this week. Um, but there is some interoperability there. Um, but as Jeff mentioned, the, the large difference would be that the, the dynamical core is different, the difference between the two um, modeling systems. Um, but you will notice that the unified post-processor can be used for both. So there, they do share some in the, sy the system, end-to-end -end system as a whole, um, they do share some similarities there. Uh, Russell, I see your hand raised. So I suppose can't help but ask the question, does this mean that WRF will stop getting in-car support at some stage for development? Or, you know, will, will this, will the, will this um, sort of replace 
the community component of uh, WRF and the NCAR support component of WRF at some stage down the track? So that's it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, that right now, the funding sources between the two are quite different. So I, I don't believe there's any, at this point, um, drive to end the support for MPAS. And I'm, I'm not sure about WARF. I think even within NCAR, a lot of it is moving towards MPAS. So um, that remains to be seen. But largely, uh, the, the NOAA is looking for community engagement on the UFS. And so that is what we are supporting here to the community to um, help with that, again, R to O or research to, to operations transition, improving the operational implementations of the models. Yeah, I would, I would also just add that the, the UFS is, is a modular framework. So the idea there um, is that uh, component, different components of the end-to-end -end system can be swapped out. So in the future, um, you know, if, if another DICOR or another UPP uh, post-processing or pre-processing system comes along that uh, that NOAA decides should be included in the UFS, then uh, the, the, the framework exists for us to swap things out. And again, that's also how CCPP was designed. Yeah, sorry, Jeff. I mean, so that it was WRF had a little bit of an idea in that as well, because of course WRF came from MM5. The idea with WRF is you could have different dynamical cores, different physics packages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's always just this idea of if you're going to do development work, you know, where would where would where is the best spot to do that work? Is it best to do it in WRF? Is it best to do it in the UFS, et cetera, et cetera, if you understand what I'm saying. So that's why the question sort of out yep. there. Yeah, definitely understand. Julie? Hi. Uh, so I have a I have a quick question. So, is there any future plan to support an idealized experiment in the mm. SRW? Yeah, that's a great question um, that I actually don't know the answer to. So um, I, I can explain some of that. So we are working on an idealized capability in the solo core FE three, um, which would include some basic uh, physics components with it. Uh, as well as we can run, uh, we can run a limited area domain within our own framework as well uh, with full physics and full topography. Thank you, Lucas. So uh, I think it will be nice if we can include these in the in the frame, in SRW framework. I guess. Okay. Yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I know there, there was also development on that in NSSL that Larissa has been leading on idealized simulations. And we've done some of that at GSL as well with uh, uh, her help uh, getting that code uh, running. All right, any other questions? Okay. Jamie, there was a question in the general channel on Slack from Chong Chi Tong. Has the forecast performance regarding using the original GFDL cubed grid and the new uniform grid been compared? Also a great question. Um, Gerard or somebody from EMC, have you guys done any of that comparison? I, I have not, but uh, you know, all the physics developers at GSL at least wanted a asked for a much more uniform grid. That's why uh, Jim started working on that. But uh, Jacob can tell us what uh, EMC has been doing in regarding that. Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, there's a manuscript in prep, um, very early, we're, we're still uh, putting things together there to describe the extended Schmidt mnemonic uh, uh, grid. Uh, there has been some uh, testing and evaluation under the context of tropical cyclones, uh, but I don't have anything at my fingertips uh, or, or that's ready for prime time sharing. Um, but there are 
other advantages um, of using it, you know, associated with the uniformity. Uh, but I don't want to uh, steal our colleagues thunder uh, from when they present on it uh, uh, later on. So I'll, I'll stop there. And we can certainly talk more offline after that uh, as well, after that presentation's uh, gone through. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Uh, and that presentation will be tomorrow um, from Shan Hu. So we look forward to hearing more then. I could, I could briefly mention that uh, in Harkin Group, we have done, uh, as, as before, uh, there's uh, some work on compare the ESG grade and uh, the uh, conventional JFDL grades. And basically the conclusion is, is uh, statistically comparable to each other. Uh, but that's, uh, again, that's uh, not running on the same dynamics options and also the domain I not uh, cover the same, exact same domain. Mm -hmm. so. Great, thanks for that input too. All right. Well, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for the conversation and the questions. Really appreciate it. Uh, so we are scheduled for a break. Um, we will come back and we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So we'll get just a little bit longer break, which is not a problem. We'll plan to come back at 1045 to talk about our next or to continue on with our next talk. Um, and we'll, we'll, the meeting will stay on. So go ahead if you would like to just leave it on and take your break, not a problem. Just make sure that you're muted and your video's off and, and we're all good. And we'll see you back at 1045. So that's 30 minutes from now. So thank you all. Right, just before we get started again here, uh, I'm going to mention that <clears throat> if you are unable to see all of the different channels within Slack, you might need to browse the channels available and join certain ones. So if you don't see things like um, the practical session or the presentations channels, um, please feel free to uh, browse the channels and join those um, other ones as well. And thank you all for all the great questions that you've already raised on Slack, as well as during the presentations. It's great to have that interaction with all of you. Um, so our next presenter will actually be Lin Lin Pan, and he will be talking to us about building the Short Range Weather app. Um, and so Lin Lin, go ahead and take it away. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, so, uh... I'm Lin Lin Pan from uh, Loa GSL at DDC. So I will talk about how to uh, build uh, the UFS short range weather IPP uh, V1.0. So uh, here's course list here, Jeff, Gerard, Julie, Lori, Mike, and Jamie. There are also many other people uh, contributed to the build of UFS short range weather app application a lot listed here. Uh, here is the documentation uh, on how to build the uh, short range weather IPP. So you can uh, follow this documentation, then go to the quick start part, the uh, uh, details on the how to build uh, the system. The components of the UFS short range weather application include the NCEP libraries, external NCEP libraries, UFS weather model, UFS utilities, uh, UPP, or also called the EMC post, uh, uh, regional workflow. All these components are necessary uh, to build the short range uh, weather application. Here's the overview of uh, UFS short range weather application components. The first part is NCEP libraries external which include the ESMF library, HDF, F5, LED-CTF, JASPER, also other uh, components. Then NCEP libraries like 
DSCIO basil, also uh, citron, CRTM, uh, W grape two, other uh, components. Uh, so these two parts are related to the library. Then you have EMC post, also, it's also called the UPP. And EFS UTERS include the regional ESG grid, uh, SFC climate uh, generation, also other uh, components. Then the UFS model, which includes FV3, uh, CCPP, Common Community Physics Package, uh, NAMS, FMS, Stochastic Physics, then the original uh, workflow built on Recurto, uh, Bash Script, Python, and YAML. Uh, one thing I needed to point out is uh, the libraries are uh, pre-installed uh, on the level one supported uh, machine. If you want to install uh, on your own machine, then you need to first install the uh, library and set libs external and set libraries by yourself. So see, here is the uh, code directory structure. When you get the code, you have the uh, UFS SR with the IPP directory. Then under this directory, you have regional workflow, also a source code directory, which includes the UFS users, uh, UFS weather model, then also uh, EMC uh, post. There are also other directory, EMV, which uh, set the environment for the build also run the workflow. When you build the system, you will also have a bin directory, have all the uh, build the ex executables. Under the UFS uh, weather model directory, you have M FMS, NAMS, FV3, Stochastic Physics. Uh, under the FV3, you have CCPP, Atmos, uh, Qubit Sphere. So, uh, when you get the code, you can know the structure and know where to modify if uh, needed. For example, the CTPV part, if you want to add or change the suite file, either go to this uh, directory. We will uh, come back a little when we talk about the CCPV part. So there are three steps to uh, build the uh, short range weather IPP, uh, which includes the first step, you get the code, then set, the, set up the environment part, then uh, build, build the executables. The second part is most important, but often we have uh, trouble to set the environment, then have the trouble to build the executables. So this is the first step. Uh, there are two parts. First part, you get the code through the Git clone. Then this is the latest released uh, branch, V1.01. Uh, after you get the code, then you need to run the ma ma manage externals to check out the externals. So through this press process, you will clone the UFS V1.01 branch, then check out all the external um, and the sub modules. The external description file is defined here called the externals uh, CFG. So you can, this is a text file. You can use VI to see uh, which component or which uh, release uh, used all these externals and the sub modules. The externals include the regional workflow, UFS utils, UFS weather model, and the uh, EMC uh, post, or called the UPP. So after you get the code, you need to set the environment. Set the environment part, you need to load the modules, also set the libraries. Uh, if you use LS uh, to see the environment directory, you will see uh, different files. For example, Xiaoyang, Gia, Hera, Jet, Orion, WCAS Cree, WCAS Style. So all these machines are, are called uh, level one supported uh, machine. Uh, we have uh, installed the NSAP 
uh, library also accepted uh, library externals. Inter means you use inter compiler. Uh, GNU glue means glue compiler. So on Cheyenne, NCA Cheyenne machine, you can have two uh, compiler. On other machine, we only uh, tested the inter. We didn't uh, try other uh, settings. So this is an example uh, for the file uh, build Cheyenne inter.env. It's in bash uh, format. So at the beginning, you put uh, clean the environment, then load, lead it, like intercompiler, the MPI, also CMAX. For this part, they load the NCEP library, external and the NCEP libraries. This is pre-installed on the uh, Cheyenne. So also on other, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the supported uh, machine, you have all these uh, libraries already installed. However, if you want to install on your own machine, you need to install the uh, NSAP libraries by yourself. Then we'll have a following uh, tutorial presentation on how to install the libraries. I will not talk about here. Then you have the import, export the uh, company uh, environment, also the machine. So we define this machine use Cheyenne, use intercompiler. So use a uh, source, build Cheyenne uh, inter.env, you can load all these modules. If you use the bash uh, environment, as other, some people maybe don't use this kind of uh, bash environment, you use TCL, for example, then you need to generate your own uh, TCL uh, environment files. Uh, the, same as the bash file. The only difference you need to change the export part to the set uh, EMV. So then same thing you can run the source uh, to load the environment. This afternoon we will uh, work on the practice on this part. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize again. So if you want to do the you install build on your own machine, you need to install NSAP library. So after the uh, installed the, uh, load the environment, set the environment, then we can start to uh, build the system. So under the directory of USS, UFS, SR weather, IPP, then uh, you can uh, make a DIR build, then enter this uh, directory, then run the CMAC to set the environment, then start to build. So after you uh, successful finish the build, uh, you will see that under the bin directory, you have all these uh, kind of uh, files, correct? For example, change uh, rest cube and other files. So how to define, uh, how to check whether the build is finished or not? One way you can vi build uh, dot out, you see the 100% in the end, it means uh, finished. So this is the uh, file name uh, description of all the extubules. Uh, so the first one, channel IS cube, uh, it's ready in the raw external models, uh, global or regional, it can be global or regional and the surface uh, climate data to create initial and uh, later boundary conditions. Then field top, field topography, uh, topography based on the resolution. Uh, normally input uh, topography, you have high resolution, but uh, the model maybe say if you run 25 kilometer or 13 kilometer is lower, then the input may, may lead to uh, smooth the uh, topography. Then the global equal resolution. So uh, calculate the global unified cubic sphere equivalent resolution for regional extended humid uh, normonic uh, grid, also called a uh, ESG grid. Then make a sort of mosaic, create a mosaic files with uh, halos, then answer post. So this uh, process, the uh, uh, post process, for the model uh, output. Then names 
dot ex be this is uh, UFS weather model executables, then ORG, uh, then uh, this generates all graphic land mass gravity wave drive files from a uh, fixed file, then regional ESG grid uh, generate yes, regional grid based on uh, user defined land list. Also, the surface SFC climate general create surface clim climatology fields from fixed files you for use in the channel uh, cube. Then, share, uh, share the access hello rows down to what is required for our pieces in the orographic and uh, grid files. Then the final one generate the hybrid uh, coordinates in the profiles. So that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Thanks, Lin Lin, for that overview. Do we have any questions for Lin Lin? Looks like we have one from Russell. Just a really quick one. Which version of CMake do you use? CMake 2 or CMake 3? Say again. Which version of CMake do you use? When uh, three point four one, I think it's it's okay. So it's CMake, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, CMake three. three. No, yeah, 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 three sixteen. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, CMake three. No worries. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Lynn then? And we'll get into a lot more of this in the hands-on practical session as well, obviously. Yep. All right. Thanks, Lynn. We are a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's okay. We'll go ahead and, and move to Julie, uh, who will be presenting on how to run the short range weather app now that we've gone over how to build it. So Julie, go ahead. Can you see my screen? Looks good. Still loading. Okay. Oh, no, there it's looks good to me now. I need to get rid of this thing on the side. Uh, I think you're okay, Julia. We can't see it, so. You should be good. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to be talking about how to run the uh, short range weather application. Can't see my first slide though. Uh, I'd like to thank all my co authors uh, shown on the first slide. And the first three slides are just going to be a little bit of background information. The first uh, Thing I wanted to show you was all this documentation we have that's generated by Read the Docs. So we have a new version for version 1.0.1 that we just tagged last week. And these slides will follow the steps, generate the workflow, and run the experiment section. So the other background I wanted to give you was that the short range weather app uses Recoto, which is a workflow management. And this is a different workflow than the regional workflow that comes with the short range weather app. And it's a system that interfaces with the batch system on a high performance computer. And it does these five tasks. Uh, it runs and manages the dependencies between all the tasks. It submits jobs to the HPC batch system as the work uh, that task dependencies allow. And it queries the batch system to get the current state of the workflow. And it automatically resubmits any failed tasks up to a given number of tries, which are specified by the user. And it also provides tools to check the status of the workflow. And it's very important, and I'll repeat this again during the talk, that to execute the entire workflow, it's an iterative process. So this Recoto run command must be executed many times to run a workflow to completion. So I think Jamie covered these tasks in her talk, but I'm going to reiterate them here because when you see the output from Recoto, you're going to want to know what these things are. 
So the first task that gets run is this make grid that um, generates the regional grid files. And then uh, make orog, it has dependency, so it's not gonna be the first task that runs, but it generates orography files. The make surface climo generates the surface climatology files. And the next two tasks um, get external data for the initial and lateral boundary conditions. And then the make ICs uh, task here generates initial conditions from the external data. The next task generates uh, lateral boundary conditions. And then finally, after all the pre-processing, the forecast gets run and then the post-processing is run. So to run the workflow, it takes three steps. The first is to set the uh, experiment parameters in config.sh, and this is all user-defined parameters that's set in a file called config.sh. Then you need to set the Python and some other environment variables. Then you run this generate workflow script that's very automated, and it basically sets up the experiment for you. And these steps can be done using scripts available with the regional workflow, which then runs all the tasks using the uh, Rakoto workflow manager. So the first thing you need to do is set uh, parameters in config.sh. So we start by making a copy of this file called configcommunity.sh, which is provided in the repository. So you CD into the uh, short range weather app, regional workflow, uh, ush directory as Gerard likes to call it, and then make a copy of this file to, uh, to config.sh so you can make your own uh, personal copy of it. And this file will contain a bunch of parameters that can be set by the user, like the machine, an account you can charge to, the name of your experiment, and some the predefined grid you'd like to use, the CCPP physics suite, and then a bunch of model parameters can also be set in there. So to generate the workflow, you need the appropriate Python environment. And this includes packages such as PyYAML, Jinja2, and a, a Fortran 90 nameless package. And um, these can all be activated using the following script. If you CD into the environment uh, directory that Linlin showed you, there's also these workflow uh, ENV scripts that you can run it and it automatically sets up the Python environment for you. So on Cheyenne, you'll see, once you type the source this file, you'll see this uh, NCAR package library, NPL, virtual environment, and it'll point you to the path. And then it'll tell you if you wanna deactivate it, just type deactivate on the command line. So step three, we're gonna actually generate the workflow and you cd into the same directory, ush, where you set up this config.sh file and just simply uh, run this generate workflow script. And there you'll get screen loads the output, but it'll end with something, some helpful directions to cd into your experiment directory, a Rokoto run command that you can use to run it by hand, a Rokoto stat, and then a a line at the bottom that you can put in your cron tab to run it uh, automated. So then you're ready to run the workflow. So this is run using Rakoto. And after you generate the uh, workflow, it'll be, it'll end up in this experiment directory. And from there you can launch the workflow. So again, this is automated. You can run it using this launch script and once you launch it, a log file will be created in your experiment directory. So you, you've generated the experiment and you've typed the launch workflow once, uh, what's happening? So if you type a uh, Rakoto stat, you'll get information like this. So it's running the workflow and it's also monitoring, monitoring the status of it. So you can see all these tasks have been uh, queued up and the three that have no dependencies are run first. That's the make grid and get the external ICs and LBCs. And you can see right after you uh, type the launch command, it's just sitting there in the queue waiting to be submitted. So 
running this launch script runs only one instance of Rokoto run and the Rokoto stat commands that look like this. And until the launch script is run again, the workflow will remain in this state. So if you type it once and you go to launch and you come back, it'll look just like when you left. So there are two options to continue running the workflow. One is to manually launch it using this launch script again, but you'll have to run it many times to complete the workflow, or you can run it via a cron tab. So just to see what's happening, let's run the launch script one more time. And you'll see that these three tasks have uh, advanced from submitted to queued for the make grid and the uh, get external ICs and LBCs have succeeded. So the other option, which I'd highly recommend is to put your launch script in your cron tab and run it about every three minutes. It looks like this, you can edit your cron tab with this cron tab minus E command, put this line in your cron tab, save it. And then you can just go back to your experiment directory and type Rakoto stat and keep track of all the tasks progressing. And when the workflow is done, you'll see something like this where all the tasks have succeeded. And he, here's a handy tip for everybody later today. If you notice that the workflow is stuck in one state after modifying your cron tab, but it advances when you type the launch script, there may be a typo in your cron tab. So I'd suggest typing cron tab minus E again and checking the path and experiment name in your cron tab file. Because when it gets stuck, it'll be like queued forever. That's, that's crazy. So there is additional documentation. Uh, there's documentation on Rakoto at the uh, GitHub site where the code comes from. Uh, UFS Utils also has a read the doc uh, user's guide. The UFS weather model also has a user's guide. And some of these are uh, related to versions that we're using in this uh, short range weather app release. And then the UPP also has a read the docs. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? Thanks, Julie. I don't see any right now in Slack. Oh, I see Julie has his hand up. Julie, go ahead. Hi, Julie. Uh, so <laughs> just I have a question. Uh, there's a there's a, so for each forecast hour, there's one uh, post task, right? So I wonder if this could be a problem. Say if you have a extend extended forecast hour, say one twenty hours, and if you have large ensemble, say forty ensemble members, there will be a huge number of these post tasks. So I'm wondering if it's possible to merge all these post tasks as one task. Uh, we haven't added that capability yet to com combine them into one task. You can reduce the number of hours that you run the UPP. So I will say one thing um, to consider, which is a benefit to having them as individual tasks is that they will kick off as soon as that particular forecast hour is done writing. That's right. um, so, so it does actually go through the system faster when you're able to run them concurrently with the model itself. Uh, so, uh, so for example, in the queuing system, uh, say uh, after all the forecast jobs have already done, but all the post jobs haven't started yet, you will still probably have a, all those post jobs pending there. It's still a possibility. They, they do run concurrently with the model. So as the model uh, forecast hour completes, the post will run. I assume it just depends on the resources you've got. If you've got the resources, it'll run. That's true. There's one other thing to add to that too. Uh, Rokoto has task throttle options. So if you're concerned about overwhelming your, your batch queuing system, maybe because there's a backlog and the post-processing jobs maybe just don't get through and then all of a sudden they get through all at once, there's task throttle options so that it won't submit a bunch of jobs all at once and overwhelm the batch queuing system such that 
you know, you can only, you can configure it to say only submit three at a time, four at a time, uh, or whatever. So there are other ways in which um, those things can be managed too. And that one's a little bit easier to configure. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob, for bringing that up. I think it's a it's a question of whether you're running something retrospectively versus in real time, and and if it's a ret retrospective ensemble situation, then Gila, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna overwhelm the queue uh, if if you've got uh, a number of members running. Um, and so, yeah, that Rakoto throttle option will come in handy. That's something we can certainly look into adding uh, into the workflow in the future. All right, we have one question uh, on Slack from June Park. How much work uh, workload will be put on the login node when a user runs the workflow in Rokoto Manager? I'm wondering if the 100 plus users running the workflow in a single login node are burdensome or not. We'll find out this afternoon. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we regularly use Rakoto on NoHPC uh, for, you know, a GSL and EMC, and uh, I, I would assume on any given day, we have probably that many users who are uh, running Rakoto on the login nodes, and, and it seems, you know, sometimes we'll have slowdowns, but generally speaking, we have pretty rapid turnaround, um, so I, I think it's okay. Hey, Jeff, I'll add that uh, for this tutorial, we limited the practical session to 40 people. So not all 100 of you will be running this afternoon. Good point. And Wayne. the Rakoto workflow manager is a pretty lightweight step. It's querying the batch system and submitting new batch jobs. It's not actually doing calculations or computations on the login nodes. So it can kind of overload the batch system sometimes if everybody's querying it all the time. But um, it's pretty lightweight. Okay. Uh, we still have 30 minutes scheduled until our lunch break. Uh, so we have plenty of time for, for any other questions that, that people have. Can we do the next talk? Um, well, uh, we, we could. Um, it just depends on whether we want to move the lunch or not. Um, I know you're interested in hearing that because it's pretty late where you are, I'm, I'm assuming. So, um, Gerard, are you, are you willing it. to present now? Are you ready? Sure, yeah. Okay, Jamie, what do you think? Uh, I, I am okay with that. Um, we we'll okay. just have to make sure that if uh, my only concern is if people were logging on just to see that later, but hopefully the people that are right. planning on being there will, are here now. So I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. Oh, I will, I will mention Jeff. It looks like there's a comment in the zoom chat. Oh, Okay, uh, so yeah, um, asking about uh, the NEMS mediator versus CMAPS. I guess I didn't under I didn't realize that the medium range weather app doesn't use NEMS. Um, yeah, the the short range weather app does use NEMS. Um, Lori, can you comment on on that question? Do you see that in your chat? Yeah, I do see that. So my understanding is that the medium range weather app release, which was about two year old code also use the NEMS mediator. They use the same case control and workflow process, but not CMAPs. And you know, it's absolutely true that the UFS weather model has moved on to CMAPs for its coupling work. So both of these apps are a little bit out of date in that respect. Okay, thank you. All right, Gerard, if you want to go ahead and, and share your screen. Let's we see, can uh... Uh, share. Where was the share? Sorry, guys. I did it yesterday, but I've forgotten. 
There's a share screen share button screen. at the bottom. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. View full screen. Does that look okay? Looks great. Okay. Well, hold on. I should. Uh... All right, great, so, thanks, Gerard. So, yep. yeah, you'll be discussing the uh, configuration uh, of the app and workflow. Yep. Uh, so my name is Gerard Katefian. I work uh, at the DTC with uh, the let's see, five other people on the team that uh, Jeff, uh, Jamie, Julie, uh, Mike, Laurie, and Linlin, who are on the DTC team for the UFS SRW app. Um, and um, all right, let's get discussing. So here's an overview of uh, the repository structure, which uh, I think Lin, Lin already discussed and uh, Jamie as well, but uh, I had it in my presentation. I thought it'd be a good reference for later people uh, can use it. So we have the main umbrella app here called UFSSR weather app. Um, and then it uses this thing called manage externals from NCAR to get the other direct uh, dependencies that it has. Regional workflow, which has uh, all the scripts for running the workflow. UFS utils, which has uh, several codes in there that are used by multiple um, UFS apps. Um, then there's the weather model itself. And then there's the post processor EMC post. And over here, I, <clears throat> I've written down um, where they are exactly in the directory structure. So you have the main, once you clone your uh, weather app, you have UFS SR weather app directory. And under there, after you run your manage externals, it'll get these uh, four um, sub repos, clone them. The workflow one will go directly on, into this subdirectory called regional workflow. Um, and then the three code directories will go under SRC and then their own names, UFS utils, UFS weather model, and EMC post. Okay, uh, here's an, again, uh, previous uh, presentations cover this, but a quick overview of how you do, do this. Um, you, so you clone your weather app, you run manage externals to get uh, your external repos, you build the codes, and then I, I should have put in here, before you do any of this, you need to, uh, load the right environment using the env slash uh, build underscore files for your the right one for your platform and you'll do that today uh, in the practical session so i'm going to cover this uh, red bullet point which is creating and editing the configuration file for the experiments config.sh and it specifies various variables that will determine how your workflow, your experiment and work, workflow uh, behave. We do have a couple of uh, small examples provided in regional workflow in, the, in that repo. Uh, these are two files called config.community.sh and config.nco.sh. And I'll discuss the difference between community and NCO modes uh, a little bit later. Um, as Julie covered, you, you could, then you call this, once, once you have your um, file set up, your config.sh file set up here, then you run generate fe3lm workflow and it'll create your experiment directory and your Rokoto XML for you, if you are using Rokoto. And um, you can, to get your experiment going, you have to run either Rokoto run over and over again on your XML file uh, and then use your Kodo stat to look at the status, or you can run this uh, launch FE3LAM workflow uh, script over and over again. Um, and if you want to do all this automatically, you can put it, put it as a cron job and Julie discussed all this and you will get practice today on how to do all that. Okay, so what's happening during the generation step is that you have this uh, script called generate fe3lam workflow.sh uh, that reads in, um, as far as we're concerned here, uh, config defaults.sh, which is uh, a set of 
well, it defines the workflow variables that you can change if you want to and, and sets default values to them. And then there's this other one that you provide, config.sh. The user provides it. And those are the customizations. And whatever you don't customize, uh, it, it'll either keep the value in config defaults or it'll somehow find another default value for it, depending on what the variable is. And the output is this experiment directory. And the name of the directory is something that you specify in your configuration file as well. A uh, bunch of other things, but the one I want to focus on here is this file called var definitions.sh. And all this is, is a in the syntax of a bash, just a set of uh, variable definitions that, that, that's, that are like, um, that are both things that you specified in your configuration file and a bunch of other variables that are there for convenience uh, that uh, specify how your experiments and workflow is gonna behave. And this script is uh, sourced by the workflow scripts so that every, every workflow task has access to the same set of variables your experiment variables. And here's a diagram of the workflow tasks. Um, so you have the, at the bottom here, you have uh, the make grid, make ORAG and make, make surface climo tasks. And as Jamie described, these you only need to run once. And for a given grid, if, you're already, if you've already run them for a previous experiment, you don't even have to run them at all. You can just use those pre-generated files because they only depend on uh, your grid. There are settings in the configuration file you can specify so that you can skip those and just use the files that you have already generated from another experiment that uses the same grid. Um, then you have these get external ICs and get external LBCs files, um, which if you have access to things like NOAA's high performance storage system, they can go get files for you for a given date from you know, the, the supported external models like FV3GFS or uh, HER or RAP. Uh, or if you don't have that, uh, you'll have to specify where on the file system those can be found because you have to somehow provide those files. So it'll point to those if you've provided them, if you've staged them somewhere. Um, and then those feed into these make ICs and make LBCs tasks, which make the initial conditions and surface conditions, this make ICs task. And the make LBCs task will create boundary conditions for every forecast hour at which uh, you wanna specify boundary conditions, the lateral boundary conditions for your regional grid. Once those are all done, then uh, you can launch the run forecast task. And once that's done, you can do your uh, post-processing. All right. So there are two sets of, uh, two groups of experiment variables, uh, the way I think of it, at least the way, um, yeah, in my mind, the way this is the big, the picture of the variables. There are primary variables that you can specify in your config.sh file. And these are the ones that are defined and assigned initial values in this config defaults.sh file. And in your, in your config.sh file, you specify a subset of these. You don't have to specify all of them. Most or many of the default values that are in the default file are fine. Um, and if you don't specify, yeah, like I said, if you don't specify them in your config.sh file, they will get it will either remain set to their initial values or, the, or they will get reset during the experiment generation step uh, to a value that depends on some of the other variables. So here's an example. If you haven't specified this Q default variable, which is uh, specifies, you know, if you have a job scheduler, there'll be a Q that you have to specify to go to, to, to send your jobs to. And if you, if you haven't specified that, then the experiment generation scripts will go and look at what machine you're on and depending on the machine will specify a default queue for you. And then there are these secondary experiment variables that you cannot specify explicitly unless you go and start um, changing the generation scripts themselves. 
but if you're not assuming you're not touching the, those, you're just uh, playing with the config.sh file. Um, you can't specify it through there. Uh, and they're they're set depending on your uh, uh, primary and possibly other secondary variables. For example, um, your experiment directory. This is a variable that you'll see often uh, in this training, expter. It's actually a secondary variable and it's obtained from the base directory that you specify or you leave set to a default value and your experiment subdirectory. So all it does is take your base directory and uh, appends to it your subdirectory. And your subdirectory is the same as your experiment name. Okay. Um, as I described earlier, both of these sets of variables are combined and placed in this file called var definitions.sh for your specific experiment. And that is uh, included in the top level of your experiment directory. And all the workflow task scripts source this file. And it, this doesn't change during your experiment so that all of them are using the same set of uh, experiment variables. It's a global variable definitions file. Okay, a um, little bit more information about these two configuration files, the default one, config defaults.sh um, and the config.sh file. The defaults one uh, defines the full set of primary meaning user specifiable experiment variables. Uh, it's located in this subdirectory called, so you have your top directory UFS SR weather app. Under there, there's the regional workflow subdirectory, which is what you cloned from the regional workflow repository. And under there, there's this uh, sub, subdirectory called USH, I just call it USH. I think it stands for user shell scripts. Uh, we inherited that. We're required to use that, so we use it. That naming convention. Uh, so it, it it's it's there. This config defaults.sh file, uh, and it is sourced by the generation script generate fe 3 lam workflowsh um, And actually, if you want documentation, this is a good place to get it. The config defaults.sh. Whenever we put a new variable in there, we define what it is and how to use it. So this is the if you're in, if you're just looking in the code, that's that's the best place to to look for the documentation. Okay, and then you have your your user customizable file config.sh. It is also in in this push subdirectory. Uh, it is also read in by generate fe3lam workflow.sh after it reads in the default values, of course. Um, and you can't just use it as a shell script because we wanted to. When we didn't want it to be a shell script. We wanted it to be more like a configuration file. So you can't just like go around defining whatever variable you want and then uh, do, do shell coding in there. So if it sees lines that are not just definitions or redefinitions of the, the variables in the defaults directory, it'll, it'll tell you and it'll quit out. Okay. So now I'm gonna go through some of the configuration variables. And I, and I group these uh, in terms of um, like topic, let's say that. Uh, first, one thing that uh, everyone should know about is the experiment mode that we have. So because this, this workflow needs to be usable by both the, re, by both researchers and opera, operational uh, setting, um, we created this, this thing called the mode of the experiment that determines the directory structure of the experiment. If you're a researcher, you, you just want to have all your files under one directory and you want to look at them in detail and maybe you're interested in you know, various aspects of it. Um, so that's why it, in that mode, it groups all, all your files, input, output, everything in one directory. It's called your experiment directory. In operational mode, um, oftentimes you're just interested in the output, say from UPP. 
Um, and in that case, you don't want to keep all the workflow file. after you're done with it, you, you know, you don't want to keep the workflow files, the intermediate files and so on. And in that case, uh, the output is your experiment is split between three different directories, experiment directory, this thing called S temp and P temp. Um, so here in this training, we're not going to be concerned about this mode and it's not supported, but it's just something to know about. If you, you'll see it in the code all over the place. So what determines which mode you run in, in this is this variable called run environment. Um, so it's either research or operational. You can set it to community. I don't know why, I can't remember why we named it community. Maybe you should call it research or something else. The research community, I guess, is what we're trying to say, or NCO, where NCO is the NCEP central operations. Um, yeah, operational mode, the NCO mode is not officially supported. And in this training, you're always going to run in community or research mode. OK. Uh, next set of uh, configuration variables are uh, the system information variables. So machine is the machine you're running on. Uh, here, we're going to be using Cheyenne. So, uh, and for each of these, if applicable, I list the valid values. So if you specify something that's not one of these valid values that were in the workflow generation step, it'll get flagged and it'll quit. And just to, and that's just to check that you're you're specifying you know sane values for things. Same thing for account. This is the account on your machine under which you're going to submit jobs to the queue, and you're going to then that account is going to get charged the core hours for those jobs. Uh, and then we have uh, the workflow manager. Um, you can either, it, it could either be set to Rakoto or none. We, we don't have another workflow manager yet. Uh, we might in the future, but for now it's either Rakoto or none. Um, you can just set it to Rakoto and it will create an XML, even if, even if you don't have a um, Rakoto installed on your machine. Um, you just don't use it later. You, you'll run it using the uh, manually using the wrapper scripts that we have. Um, so if, if you really don't want that XML, you can change it to none, but it's it's not a big deal either way. So I'd suggest leaving it as Rakoto. Okay, so the variables that describe or specify where your experiment directory is located. First, there's a base directory. Um, so its default value is going to be in this directory called x expt underscore ders, and that's going to be on the same level as your UFS SR weather app directory by default. And in this training, we're just going to leave it at that location. But if you need to have your experiment directory located somewhere completely different away from where you have your uh, workflow scripts and all that, uh, or where, where you have the app cloned, then you can use this parameter to specify that location. And then you have this next variable, experiment subdirectory. This is, I, I think of this as the name of the sub of, of your experiment. And all that's going to do is create a subdirectory under your experiment base directory with that name. Um, and it'll put everything under that directory. All, all input and output files will be there. And you have to specify this in config.sh. You cannot, there's no default value for it. OK, uh, how do you specify the forecast dates and hours and the length of the forecast? It's these variables, date first cycle, date last cycle. Um, so this, so in general, you can run multiple forecasts. They're called cycles. Um, and, and these are specifying the, the starting date of the first cycle and the starting date of the last cycle. It, it's, it's not the starting and ending date of a single forecast. It's, they're, they're both starting dates of forecasts, just to be clear about that. Um, and if you're just running one forecast, uh, you, you set them to the same thing. And they need to be eight digit strings of the form 
uh, a four digit year, a two digit month and a two digit year. It does not include the hour. The hours are specified in the next variable called cycle hours right here. It's an array, so you can have uh, any number between 00, 0 and 23, then multiple of them. If you're, for example, want to do hour 0 and hour 6, you would have an array uh, for 00, 0, and then the next element would be 0, 06. Uh, forecast length is just uh, the length of each forecast in hours. All the forecasts currently that you do in your experiment are the same length, although uh, we will be changing that in the develop branch in the future to give more flexibility, as well as probably uh, include a, um, an interval in, in, in days so that if you don't like if you're going from first cycle date first cycle to that date last cycle it the default interval is one day so all days between those two dates will be run but if you want to do like every three day or something we need will uh, we don't have it yet but we will hit the develop branch add um, a parameter for that okay here's an example uh, let's say you specify in your config.sh file these settings. Date of your first cycle is 2021, uh, June 1st. Your last cycle is 2021, uh, June 15th. And your cycle hours are 00, 0 and 12. Uh, then you're running, the, the list that you're running is, is right here. Um, up, yeah. So you're running a total of uh, 30 forecasts if you do this two per day, and each one is 36 hours long. OK, next group of variables are the grid variables. Um, in this training, we're not going to do custom grids, so we're going to stick with the predefined grids that are in the app. And you specify which one that can be uh, using this variable, predefined grid name. And the supported values for the release are these three CONUS grids. One is a 25 kilometer grid, the other one 13, and then the last one is the finest three kilometer grid. So you have to specify, um, well, actually no, the default, there's a default value, which is I believe the 25 kilometer grid. But anyway, you, you specify this in, again in your config.sh, unless you're doing a custom grid and we're gonna discuss that, uh, how to do that tomorrow. Um, and okay, so the next one is the physics suite that you wanna use. Um, it's this variable, CCPP physics suite. The valid values are FE3GFS version 15.2 uh, or RRFS V1 alpha and the default value is GFS 15.2. And there'll be more discussion of that uh, in other presentations in the next few days. Okay, next group of variables are the external, the ones that specify what external model to use for generating your initial and boundary conditions. Uh, so there's one, this one for ICs, initial conditions is called external model name ICs. And then the one for uh, lateral boundary conditions and it's with LBCs. And there are a lot of variables like that. One is for ICs, one's for LBCs. You'll see that, you'll see that all over the place. So the valid values for these are GSM GFS, which is the old GFS, the spectral GFS, then FV3 GFS, uh, the FV3 based one newer, then we have RAP, HER, and NAM as well. And these are regional models. And the default value is set to FV3 GFS. Uh, next one is the interval with which to specify your boundary conditions. So your lateral boundary conditions, you know, you can specify every three hours if that data is available, or every six hours, every one hour, if you have that kind of time resolution. Um, default value is six, um, but for example, if you set it to three, as I described here, then uh, the, this, the the external get external LBCs task is going to try to look for files 
that match the, those forecast hours, starting with hour three, then hour six, then hour nine, and so on. Hour zero is always done as part of the initial conditions, just so you know that one. As well as um, the surface uh, parameters, surface fields are also uh, created during the initial conditions generation, not in the boundary conditions. Okay, and then uh, this one, FV3GFS file format uh, for ICs and LBCs. So uh, for FV3GFS, there are two file formats supported, NEMS.io and GRIB2. Um, so if, depending on which one you, you wanna use, uh, you can specify which one the default is NEMS.io. But these days, uh, NEMS.io is no longer being used. I believe everything has switched over to NetCDF or GRIB2, so, um, but, there's a bunch of um, data in in storage that is NEMS.io. So we need to have that if you're doing uh, retrospectives. Okay. Then uh, this is a set of variables that specify how you, or how to get the, let's see, that specify that you're using user staged external model data. So the first one is this uh, use user stage external model files, just a true or false flag. And if you set it to true, it means um, you've, there's a directory that the workflow should look in to find your uh, external model files from which to generate initial and boundary conditions. The default value is false, but uh, here we're always gonna, in this training, we're gonna reset it to, tr to true. So, and you have to specify then the base directory where uh, the initial and boundary condition external files are located. Um, the one is for ICs, one is, one is for LBCs. And this is just the base directory. So what, what the workflow will do is add the cycle date and hour to it as a subdirectory and then look under there for your files. And then uh, you have to actually name the, the files, whatever you want to call them. Uh, these are two arrays, external model files for ICs and external model files for LBCs. So uh, let's look at an example of how you put all these together. So here we're doing a forecast length of uh, 48 hours. So all the forecasts are going to be 48 hours. Um, and we're specifying the boundary conditions every six hours. LBC specification interval in hours is six. We're using FV3 GFS data for both the initial and boundary conditions. We're using GRIB2 format, not NEMS.io in this case. And we're specifying that, yes, go look for the files in user specified directories. And those are for the ICs, they're here. This is the directory under which to look for the boundary conditions, look for this one. Uh, the initial condition files, the set of files to use for that is this array, it only has one element. If you were using NEMS.io, it, it split into two, one is for atmospheric variables, the other one is for surface variables. So there'd be two elements in this array. And then for the, your uh, lateral boundary, boundary condition files, um, here they are. Um, you have to specify the name of each, uh, you have to specify a name for each hour at which you specify you have a boundary condition or you want to have a boundary condition. So if you have a 48 hour forecast and you're specifying boundary conditions every six hours, that means you have eight times at which you need a boundary condition file, not including the initial time. So that's why you need to have eight files in this array. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you have a, the, the grid orography and surface climatology files, uh, they depend only on the grid and that's why they're called fixed files. Uh, they're static. So if you've generated these once for an experiment and you're using that same grid for uh, subsequent experiments, then you don't need to do those steps over and over again. They're not, they don't take long, but still they're kind of a wait. So what you can do is turn off those tasks using these 
run task make grid or run task make org or run task make surface climb or variables, you, you set them to false. Default value is true. So you set them to false. And if you do that, you have to specify to the workflow where to find the grid files, the pre-generated grid files. Uh, <clears throat> so, and you just set that there. It's just, we're not gonna practice this one. It's not part of the sessions, but it's just something good to know if you don't wanna keep repeating these three um, tasks for the same grid. Okay, and then post-processor uh, configuration variables. Uh, there's this uh, Boolean flag, use custom post config file, true or false, it default value is false. Um, if, you, if you leave it at the default value, then there's a default configuration file that it will use. Otherwise, you have to specify the full path to your custom configuration file using this variable, custom post config FP. FP stands for full path or file path, so it's a full path. Sometimes you'll see FN, which is which would stand for file name. That would just be the file name, but in this case, FP. So it's the whole full path. Okay, some miscellaneous variables. Uh, Pre-existing directory method. So a lot of times you'll run the same, um, you'll tweak something, I'll run the same experiment again and again and again. So this specifies what to do if there's a previous subdirectory of the same name in your uh, base experiments directory. Uh, <clears throat> you, can, you can delete, if one exists, just delete it, rename it, or have the work, or the expert, have the work, no, experiment generation script quit out and say, well, I don't know what to do. Uh, I usually set it to rename because I like to make backup copies and then later on come back and once I'm done, fix my bug or whatever, delete all the, uh, backup files, but up to you how you want to deal with that. Then, uh, as Julie discussed a bit, uh, how do you uh, automate uh, relaunching of your workflow? There's this variable called use cron to relaunch, and it's either true or false. And what it will do if you set it to true is it'll go into your cron table and put in an entry there, a job uh, that calls this launch script, launch FE3 LAM workflow every however many minutes you want. And those minutes are specified by this next variable called cron relaunch interval in minutes. Uh, default values every three minutes, um, you can change that. Uh, I find it convenient to do this. Um, and if, you can do this and manually at the same time, uh, launch this, uh, call the script, launch FV3 LAM workflow. They, they, they can work together. So because the cron job is doing the same thing for you, you launching that script, but you can do it manually before. So you don't have to wait three minutes is what I'm saying. Okay. All right. That was all I had. Um, questions? Thanks, Gerard. Um, there have been a couple questions in Slack, which I've tried to respond to, but we can we can discuss them here. There was a question about NetCDF uh, file support for FE3 GFS, and yes, that does exist. Um, so you can use either NEMS.io, GRIB2, or NetCDF files for the regional external model data. Um, you'll need to use uh, GRIB2, however. Um, Another question from June Park regarding older um, model data, external model data from you know over five years ago. Um, he was interested in looking at something from 2013 for the Moore outbreak, um, for example. And I went ahead and you know we I mentioned that we initially when we were developing the short range weather app, we used fairly recent uh, external model data uh, to make sure we were reading in data correctly in the change risk cube. Uh, which is the pre-processing utility. And so anything prior to say 2018 really hasn't been tested. That's not to say it wouldn't work, um, but it may or may not work. Um, so it would be, you know, it's worth trying to see if you can read it in. And there may be certain variables that are different in the GRIB2 files from, you know, really old uh, external model data. And that's something that could be tweaked in ChangeRisk Cube to read that data incorrectly. So it's, it's certainly possible. Um, 
Any I, any other questions? Jeff, Jeff, yes. I will add. I have um, when we were when we were testing uh, all of the different things that we added into Change Drives Cube. I believe I have run stuff that's older. Um, okay. And I think for the most part, if uh, you're not looking for perfection, like there might be some handling of surface variables that's maybe not appropriate, um, but it won't create wrong results. But some of the older files, um, as long as the grib too, especially the stuff that's available from um, NCEI's website, they're all kind of standardized. So they all kind of look the same. Um, so you might have some luck, especially if it's coming from NCEI's database. No, that's good. Yeah, I was I was actually wondering if maybe some of the surface fields, if they're named differently or something, then they it would just be replaced by Climo um, if it's not found. Um, but that that's good to know that uh, it sounds like we can run um, some older data. So. So question in chat, how do we handle the new GFS grid versions? You need to update the V table or something like that when new GFS is released. Um, Larissa, do you want to handle that question? I'm not sure what, where, where was that question at? Oh, it's in the chat. It's in the, um, yeah, it's in the chat there. Uh, so if it's, if we're talking about the grid that the input data is actually on, um, that information is read straight from the metadata and the variables themselves in the input data. So um, the grid that the input data is on shouldn't cause any changes because ChangeRes doesn't make assumptions about the data um, based on um, what you, you know, if you tell it it's GFS data, it doesn't make some sort of assumption about what grid it thinks it on, it's on since we know that, you know, GFS, you can get it on 25 kilometer or 12, you know, there's all kinds of uh, grids that it's available on. So it doesn't make those kinds of assumptions. So when, when there's an update to a variable and the V table is modified, does change res need to read in that V table or does it, does it need to be modified in the, in the source code? What's what's updated? I'm not sure what's updated in the V table. Like what what are we talking about? Is it is it uh, just a different grid? I'm not sure if he's referring to that or or referring to a variable change or an addition of a variable. So I mean what's happened in past years is that the GFS starts out putting a different variable name for something like you know surface soil moisture or something. And it changes the name and the metadata so that um, your input processing has to recognize that new variable. In WARF, that's a V table, but I don't think it is in ChangeRes Q. I'm not sure where that happens. Um, in ChangeRes, uh, we do make assumptions about the standard names of variables since those are generally governed by the WMO's GRIB2 file, you know, the, the tables. Um, we haven't had problems with surface variable names changing so much as tracer names changing. Yeah, that was just off the top um, of my head a couple of years ago. I yeah. think GFS 7, 2017. Yeah, I think changed something and all of a sudden none of the pre processing would work anymore because it couldn't find the variable in the grid file that it wanted to map into a model variable. Yeah, I think so. I think it, here, it's still, it, yeah, if Sorry, some name does change, if some name does change that um, does cause problems, we'll have to address that. Usually, we've been able to just, you know, add in an extra if statement somewhere to offer the ability to look for that other variable. Um, but we that that can be done without, you know, a minor bug fix release that won't take very long at all to get into the develop branch. Yeah, so if it's a modification or a deviation from the GRIB2 tables, um, standard tables, then yeah, it definitely has to go into the source code as a branch. And we do have quite a few of those in there to handle different versions uh, of the regional models in particular. Um, so we would just need to, to modify it that way, it sounds like.
Any other questions? Oh, I think I see one in the general channel on Slack. Is there a plan to support the use of other global models for initializing short, the short range weather app, including ECMWF? That's a great question. And there has been interest in initializing off of other global models. And I mean, we would love to get that capability into to change res, for example. It's just a, it's a matter of, of time being able to, to get that in there. Um, I think, Larissa, you got UK Met working, right? I did um, for an experiment we did in the 2020 um, spring experiment at NSSL. We ran uh, FV3 initialized and boundary conditions from the UK Met. So um, that kind of, and it really wasn't crazy difficult because they still use the standard WMO GRIB2 tables. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't super difficult to get working. So um, in the future, those kinds of additions aren't. Um, it's time, but they're not out of the question, and they're not you know yeah. years and years and years in the future. No, and that's I mean ECMWF is certainly a, a great example of one that we would also like to get in there uh, just so we could compare uh, initializing, for example, the RFS off of that versus the GFS to see. Um, how that handles, um, you know, how, how, how is model forecast accuracy dependent on your initial and, and lateral boundary conditions, um, particularly since the ECMWF is, is the world leader in, in global uh, forecast accuracy. So definitely something of interest for the RFS in the future. Marissa, I'm curious if you guys have considered contributing the modifications needed for um, initializing out the UK Met Office back in to develop, if that's something you'd be willing to do. Yeah, it was it was done, you know, just quick, probably not perfectly documented um, to get it working for the for the SFE. But um, I, I don't think it would be super difficult to contribute back to develop at some point. And then the, the uh, processing for ECMWF sh probably should look pretty similar to the way that was done. So. That'd be great. Thanks. Any other questions? If not, um, thank you, Gerard, for that uh, thorough overview. That's a great look at, at how we can configure the workflow. Hopefully that was very useful and informative uh, to everyone here. And, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers um, today, since this is actually the last one before the practical session, um, for your presentations. We appreciate your work uh, that you, that's gone into that. And we'll um, break until 1.15 mountain time, at which point, or 1.30, uh, we'll, we'll uh, join back for the practical session. So this will only be the 40 participants who are um, going to be uh, attending the practical session. Uh, for the rest of the participants that are here, uh, we'll reconvene tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, but for those of you who will be continuing this afternoon in the practical session, you should all have a calendar invite for a Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, we will see you all uh, around 1.15 Mountain Time this afternoon after our lunch break right now. So thanks.